Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the Suburban Rifleman. Now, today's episode is going to be primarily a bench top video. We're going to be doing a very simple, very straightforward home gunsmithing project that anybody should be able to perform if you've got a little bit of patience. Uh, don't get too heavy handed, and you have a basic knowledge of hand tools. Anybody should be able to complete this project. Uh, very satisfactorily. Unfortunately, there will not be a shooting segment related to this project in this video. As is the case with so many other non-essential businesses, my club is currently closed. Hopefully that will be changing soon and definitely do keep your eyes open for uh, a shooting video related to this project and other shooting videos coming up over the uh, uh, upcoming season. So anyway, Today I want to take a look at putting a receiver sight onto a Marlin lever action rifle. Specifically, I am talking about the Marlin Model 39A. I did clear it before I started the video, but it's definitely still empty. Um, I recently got this rifle from my dad. Um, I have a long history with Marlin lever action rifles. I've never owned a 39A but uh, not until now, but my dad's had this one for quite some time. And my dad's getting up into his 80s now. He likes to have scopes on everything. It makes a lot of sense. I put scopes on most of my rifles. Um, I'm getting up into my 50s and my eyes aren't what they used to be. But I kind of feel like on a lightweight little, this is actually the Mountie version, a lightweight little saddle carbine like this, the scope just really ruins the balance and the handling characteristics of this rifle. Uh, so on most of my lever action rifles, I like to install a receiver mounted peep sight. When we do the shooting video uh, regarding this project, I will go into uh, much more detail about why I'm putting the specific receiver sight that I am putting on this rifle. But anyway, for my purposes, I have chosen a receiver sight from Williams Gun Sight Company. Um, I have some experience with Williams uh, Gun Sight receiver sights on lever action rifles. This is my trusty old uh, Marlin 336 in 3030. And I have a Williams uh, 5D model receiver sight mounted on this rifle. The 5D is pretty much, it's highly adjustable. But once you get it adjusted and get everything locked down, it's pretty much a set it and forget it type sight. It's very rugged. Uh, it's very precise. It allows you to shoot very instinctively and it really does not move. Um, I've been hunting with this rifle, black bear and deer for about 20 years. Uh, when I take this rifle to bear camp or deer camp, we drag a picnic table out near the cabin fire a couple of rounds. The rifle's always right on target. I haven't adjusted this sight in about 20 years probably, and it always puts the bullet exactly where I need it to go. And I've been very pleased with Williams. Um, Lyman is still in business. Lyman makes some receiver sights. Redfield used to be like the gold standard in receiver sights. They're unfortunately no longer in business. And while they did produce quite a few uh, receiver sights which would fit on my 39A and they do come up with pretty much regularity on eBay they sell for ridiculously high prices and I didn't want to spend that kind of money. Now you can actually get a Williams 5D very similar to this one which is made to fit the Marlin 39A and it only costs about 35 bucks or so. The problem is I need a sight which is going to be much more adjustable. I'm using my 22s, as the channel name implies, in usually, I'm not really suburban, I would describe my area more as semi-rural, but we, we've been trying to keep the noise levels down, not just when we're target shooting, but also when we're doing uh, varmint control. So we've taken to using subsonic rimfire ammo, 22 long rifle specifically, and even more specifically, I really like the Ely subsonic hollow point. It has a really cavernous hollow tip which expands the bullet very reliably even at very slow speeds. And it's got a relatively long high sectional density high ballistic coefficient bullet. It performs really well even at longer ranges but it has a very high 
arcing trajectory. So if I want to shoot much past 100 yards, I've got to be able to make pretty significant elevation adjustments with my sights. So the Williams receiver sight that I've settled on to install on my 39A is actually the Williams FP, FP standing for foolproof, 39, 39 standing for 39A, TK. And TK stands for target knobs. The Williams foolproof is a micrometer adjustable sight. They sell them without target knobs, but if you get the regular foolproof without the target knobs, you need to have a screwdriver with you in the field to make adjustments to your sights. I don't want to have to do that. So I've opted for the model that's already equipped with target knobs. The problem being that the target knobs that are installed on the site, I don't believe are going to give me enough elevation adjustment to reach out to 150 or more yards. Now, luckily, Williams actually sells an accessory target elevation knob, which will give you extra elevation adjustment, which should give me the range that I need. Uh, in addition to that, the gib lock nut, which uh, locks down the sight so that it doesn't move when you're shooting, is also generally locked and unlocked with a screwdriver. Williams likewise sells an accessory knob so you can lock down the gib lock without using a screwdriver as well. So we're going to be installing that on the site. And in addition, I'm going to be installing from Marble Arms a filler, much like the one that I have on my 3030 here. It's just a filler block that will fill in the 3 8 inch dovetail on the barrel to give it a nice clean look after we remove the open sights off of the rifle barrel. Now, I had a hard time finding all of this stuff that I needed. Uh, some places had some things in stock. Nobody had the site in stock until I went to the website of Buffalo Arms Company in Ponderé, Idaho. Buffalo Arms sells all kinds of, as the name implies, like Sharps Rifle, Buffalo Rifle type stuff. I think they also sell a lot of cowboy action shooting supplies. It's a real cowboy type uh, gun supply company and they had everything I needed in stock. Uh, the site was 67 bucks. The marbles uh, 3 8 inch dovetail rear sight slot blank was $5.99. The extra long elevation knob was $6.89 and for some reason the gib lock knob was $10.19. It's probably the simplest thing in there and it costs the most. But Anyway, that only brought me up to just a little bit over $100, and to Buffalo Arms credit, I think I ordered this stuff on Monday, and I had it on Friday. So from the almost all the way at the West Coast to the East Coast during a global pandemic, and I got my stuff that quickly, I think that's pretty impressive. So anyway, without any further ado, let's move down to the workbench and install this site on our 39A and remove this scope. Let's go do it. All right, so you can see we have our rifle here on the bench. This is our 39A. I have cleared it. Let's confirm that. There's nothing in the chamber, nothing in the magazine. She is safe and good to go. As a matter of fact, why don't we just leave the action open for now? So of course we've got our rifle. We have a screwdriver, which has a bunch of uh, various bits in it, uh, most of which are parallel sided. This is not specifically a gunsmithing screwdriver, but uh, it'll serve the purpose. And uh, these Marlin rifles have very few screws that are really, really weird. So uh, I'll be able to do everything I can do with this. The most important thing, though, is to have hollow ground uh, precision type parallel sided screwdrivers and not start attacking your home gunsmithing project with carpentry screwdrivers. I've got that. I've got a brass screw here which is going to serve as a drift punch when it comes time to remove the existing rear sight. I've got some uh, precision screwdrivers here because the actual Williams sight has some very small screws on it which we're probably going to need that. Um, of course, I have my new Williams uh, foolproof 39 
you can see it already has the target knobs installed and so we're going to be putting this onto the rifle today and I have a an accessory knob to work the gib lock I'll explain that in a little bit and I have an extra tall elevation knob for the site. This is made by Williams. It's an accessory. I don't know if we're going to need this or not, so we probably will not be installing this today. But just for your information, it's the Williams Gunsight Foolproof Target Knob Long Elevation, uh, which fits some foolproof sights. I know that it fits this site. I'm not sure if I'm going to, if it's really necessary though. I don't want to go disassembling the actual site any more than I absolutely have to. Um, and then we've got this uh, slot blank for a 3 8 inch dovetail made by Marble. Um, by Marble Arms and it's going to replace the, it's, it's going to fill in the 3 8 inch dovetail slot when we remove the factory rear sight off of the rifle. Um, the 39A is a takedown model. You can take it down fairly easily by removing this uh, knob screw here. Uh, we're not going to end up actually disassembling the rifle at this point because I don't think it's necessary for doing this project. You can see I've already removed the scope and the scope rings for sake of brevity, uh, but the base is still in place and you can see we're going to have to remove that by removing these two screws. That's all that holds the base onto the top of the receiver. So let's do that. This is a very easy part of the job. I already have the correct bit in the screwdriver and so we'll simply loosen these screws to remove the rear sight. That should come off fairly easily. As soon as you feel the threads skipping a little bit, you know that it's disengaged and we can just lift that right off of there. And okay, that came off nice and clean. There's a little bit of oil there. We'll clean those up before we move on to the next step. So I've got that fairly wiped down now. You can see there's two empty holes where the mounting screws were. Uh, there's a third hole and that's got a filler screw in it. And I don't know what happened to the original filler screws for these holes. You can buy those from a gun uh, smithing supply place like Brownells or Midway. Uh, so before we go any further, let's take the Williams uh, foolproof receiver sight out of its packaging and just confirm that it is the correct rear sight for the job. I'll set the packaging over to the side. Here is the rear sight. You can see it's got an elevation, it has an elevation knob here and a windage adjustment knob. And as I said, it's going to mount onto the left side of this receiver. But we need to make sure before we start drifting out the factory rear sight or anything that the holes the mounting holes here are going to line up uh, with the mounting holes in the receiver. So the first thing I have to do is to remove uh, the elevation slide uh, from the mounting block. And so in order to do that, the very first thing we have to do is to remove the gib lock screw and the uh, gib lock bushing that's in there that locks the elevation slide in place. That should be loose now. I'll simply remove that. And keep in mind this gib lock bushing has a slanted surface here which engages the bevel on the slide. So you've got to have that oriented correctly when you reinstall it into the rear sight. The second thing we've got to do is we need to remove the elevation lock screw which is right there. I need to get one of my precision screwdrivers to do that. Alright, so I have the correct precision screwdriver 
and we will just carefully remove the elevation locking screw. If you want a more detailed instruction on how to really disassemble one of these Williams foolproof sights, uh, Williams themselves have a very comprehensive uh, set of videos here on YouTube or other video hosting platforms to show you how to do that. So by turning the elevation screw now counterclockwise, you'll see, and it is micrometer adjustable, you'll feel the clicks, you'll see that the that the slide is moving upwards and you've got to unscrew this the entire way to remove this slide. So, so we'll just keep spinning this around and around and around. There's a little ball detent in there that provides the clicking. And we've unscrewed it to the point now where we can take the slide right out. One of the two mounting screws is already in its hole and was held captive uh, by that slide. The second mounting screw is in a little uh, plastic bag that's going to go in this other hole. So let's just hold this up and confirm that those holes line up with the mounting holes and it appears that they do. So our first step is complete. So now we'll set this aside with everything else and we'll go ahead and remove these two filler screws and they should unscrew fairly easily. They're tiny little things so be careful not to lose them. Neither of them was terribly, terribly tight. So we're going to go ahead with the project. I don't want to wait. Um, the site is going to overhang this hole, so I'm going to have to remove it again, or at least I'm going to have to remove the elevation slide from it in the future. But I don't want to wait a week or two until I can get filler screws to do this. So we're just going to proceed without worrying about those filler screw holes for the moment. Okay, so we've immediately come up against another problem, uh, which I was going to address right away, uh, but it turns out like it's going to be a little bit more difficult than I thought. I had mentioned in the intro that I was going to replace the Giblock screw, which requires the use of a screwdriver, with this thumb adjustable uh, knob. And I had read a few re uh, reviews talking about this where they said that they had to, uh, con the end user had to considerably reduce the length of the Giblock knob. And it looks like that's going to be the case here. Um, it's got a lot more threads than the original Giblock screw does. Um, like a lot more threads. And so I was going to, before I mounted the block, just run this right through, mark it, and then we were going to reduce the length of this. Um, the problem is the hole is actually not threaded all the way through the block. It only screws into a certain point and stops. And I don't want to put any more pressure on it than absolutely necessary. So again, we're going to go forward with installation. Um, I'm going to have to address this in the future. I'm going to uh, end up taking this down to the machine shop probably and using uh, the proper equipment to shorten this screw to the length of the original Giblock screw. But for the time being, we're going to use uh, what came with the site and we'll just put this Giblock knob back in the bag for the moment and uh, that'll be for a future project. And mostly just for my own reference, this isn't really for you guys, uh, just so I remember, I'm taking these two filler screws and I am also going to put them in this little Ziploc bag because that is a nice safe place for them. So now, before we proceed any further, um, these Williams sights are quite robust. Uh, I have, don't have a lot of experience with the foolproof micrometer adjustable sights. I do have some experience uh, with the 5D sight, like the one on my uh, Marlon 336. So they're fairly robust, but you look at this thing, it's an aluminum 
sort of gantry with target knobs and everything on it. Overall, that's not probably the most robust setup in the world, so I don't want to go banging on the rifle after I've got this installed. So, before we go ahead with installing the Williams sight, I'm going to try drifting out the factory rear sight and installing the uh, Marbles 3 8 dovetail filler block that we have right here. So, first thing I got to do is remove the rear sight. Now, it is just in a dovetail. It's, uh, so it's drift adjustable left and right. They generally are not super tight. I have dealt with these in the past. They are meant to be drift adjustable for uh, sighting purposes, so they can't be in there super, super, super tight. They just need to be tight enough that they don't move under normal use. Um, so we're going to set up a little wooden block or a couple little wooden blocks and we're going to use this brass screw and try drifting it out. Now, this is a handy tip that you might not know and it holds true for most American firearms. It certainly holds true for Marlin. On American rifles, generally, the correct way to remove them is to hold the weapon with the muzzle pointed downrange in a vertical position like this, so you've clearly got a left and a right, and they almost always come out left to right and go in right to left. So I need to drift this rear sight uh, base out of the dovetail in a left to right uh, direction. So I'm going to get that set up a few minutes. You don't need to watch that, and we'll come back to actually drifting the thing out. All right, so the rear sight on this carbine was a bit more stubborn uh, than I was hoping, even though I have it spaced up with soft pine blocks. Um, I was afraid of perhaps damaging this beautiful wood uh, walnut forearm, and so I've just removed the forearm. There's two screws that go into the nose cap, one on either side. You remove those, you slide the nose cap forward and just by wiggling this ever so slightly you can get it to drop out and down. So I think I now have the sight where I need it to be and I'll just finish drifting it out at this point. And it's coming out and there it is. So we now have the rear sight removed and we will put that stuff, you can see the, the, um, the dovetail block on this sight was simply uh, a folded sheet metal affair. These are not the greatest rear sights in the world. Some of the open sights that Marlin has used over the years were made by marbles and they have nice machined pieces and stuff in them. This is not one of the better ones. However, this is a, a rifle from 1957 or 1958, so this is an original part. We definitely don't want to go losing that, so we're going to go ahead and drop that into the same Ziploc plastic bag that we put the filler screws uh, for the side of the receiver in. I like to keep as much stuff consolidated from one project as I can, then I'll write it on the label. And then if I ever want to put the rifle back in the condition it was in when I got it, I have all the parts neatly organized. Now, the one thing about these guns that have been used out in the weather, underneath the rear sight is a place where they generally end up with a lot of crud and scuzz. This one is no exception to the rule. So I'm going to clean this up quickly uh, before we go ahead and install that new dovetail uh, filler block. Alright, so that cleaned up fairly well. It might need a little bit more TLC going forward. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and install now our Marbles uh, 3 8 inch filler block. So let me get this out of this bag and I will get right back to you. Okay, so some of you sharp-eyed uh, continuity nerds may have noticed that our 
general layout here has changed a little bit. I got interrupted making this video and it's been just about a week uh, since the last step. Uh, this has just been sitting un more or less untouched, although I had to put all the parts away. Um, so the layout's a little bit different, but uh, so it's been just about a week and I thought, wow, that's great because that'll give me a chance uh, actually to source the little, oh, and by the way, this has been sitting in parts. Uh, the magazine tube is out. It's laying over there. So the rifle is still clear. I did check it earlier. There's no rounds in the gun uh, for safety's sake. And I thought, well, it'll give me a great opportunity to source some more of these little filler screws to go in the top. And I was actually able to locate those uh, through a trusted uh, seller on eBay. Uh, I got actual Marlin factory filler screws and luckily for me they were delivered on Friday and uh, I was away in the mountains on a turkey hunting trip so the, bright and early this morning I went uh, traipsing on down to the post office only to find one of those frustrating yellow uh, attempted delivery notices in my post office box. So apparently, even though they're tiny little microscopic screws, and I just bought a couple of them, uh, they must have been put in a package that was too big to fit in my post office box. So we're just, as I said last week, we're going to soldier on without these. I do have the correct screws, and they'll get installed. Um, an important thing to note is there are... Uh, if you buy these filler screws, there are two different varieties, at least for Marlin firearms. There's uh, one that's just a straight threaded shank with a flat uh, top on it. It's like the one that's installed here. And with the, and they just have a little uh, screwdriver slot in there. And with those, you put a little drop of Loctite and you run them in till they're perfectly flush. This one's actually a bit below flush, which bothers me. I will be backing that one out and reinstalling it when I install the other two. The second type of screw is a positive stop screw, and it has a tiny little shoulder at the top end of the screw. It's not quite a screw head, but it's almost a screw head. Um, those you don't have to use any thread locker on. You you run them in until the shoulder bears up against uh, the receiver and then you just barely snug them with like two fingers. You don't want to go cranking on them. Barely snug them and that'll be enough to keep them in place. No thread locker. I don't like those because they do make a little bit of a of a bump here. Not enough to really obstruct anything but I prefer the flush mounted uh, straight shanked screws uh, with a little bit of thread locker. It makes a nice flat uh, even surface. Unfortunately, I won't be able to show you those today, um, but I will be installing those in the next couple of days. It might have made sense to wait till I actually had them in hand and go ahead and install them, but I really don't think I'll have any time to do any shooting, any uh, uh, filming later this week, and I have time today. So we're just going to pretend like we got them, pretend like we installed them, and soldier on. Um, again, I've cleaned up the empty dovetail. Uh, that our rear sight was in, and now it comes time to install our filler block from Marble Arms. Um, I've done several of these in the past on centerfire Marlin rifles. This is the first time I'm doing one on a rimfire rifle. It's a nicely machined little piece of steel. Uh, you can see it has the, uh, oh, I had it right side up the first time. You can see it has the little Marble Arms logo on there. And there's a little dimple towards one end of these filler blocks. It used to be a little slot. Now they're doing a little uh, dimple. And that denotes which end, because this is slightly tapered, so when it goes into the dovetail, it'll, it'll get tight. It's slightly tapered, not by very much. I've got my cheap digital calipers here. So on the undimpled end, the slot is about 0.32 um, on this end it's about 0.31 so it's about a hundredth of an inch difference from one end to the other so this is the end you want to put in first now when I've done center fire rifles in the past um, I haven't really had to do any fitting of this block but those were 1980s vintage rifles and they were center fire and you want to enter and again we're going 
Remember, we went out left to right, so now we're going in right to left. And you want the block to enter the dovetail about halfway across the barrel, maybe even three quarters of the way. This doesn't have to be super tight. Once we get it in there, as long as it's nice and snug, it's not going to move. And we don't want to risk uh, expanding the dovetail in the barrel uh, because we may want to put the factory rear sight back on it. We want that to fit nice and tight. Now, and also, we don't want this to go in crooked. So the further you can get it to just slide in, the better aligned it's going to be before we start drifting it. Uh, now you can see this one does not go in very far at all. And again, we don't want to uh, uh, modify the dovetail in the barrel, so we're going to uh, modify this filler block a little bit. And the way I'm going to do that, I have a triangular piece of uh, Norton stone here, and the angle on one of these uh, triangular stones is exactly right to fit the, uh, the slot here in this filler block. When you put it in there, you can feel once you get it in there nice and square and tight, it doesn't rock at all. So we're going to put a couple little drops of oil on the stone and we're going to take like five swipes on this side and then five swipes on this side and we'll try fitting it. And we'll see it slowly move over. Now I'm not going to do that. It's a tedious process. So we're going to skip ahead, but I just want to let you know how I'm doing this. Um, if you're the type of person who wants everything to be really, really Solid, you could probably clamp this up in a vise as you're making it and making the adjustments. Um, I find that I can do this pretty well by hand. Uh, it's very important though, try to take uh, so many swipes off this side and then so many swipes off that side. Keep it even uh, so that your filler block doesn't end up being off one way or the other. So we'll be right back. Uh, it'll probably take me about 20 or 30 minutes to get this fit and uh, I'll come back and we'll drift that in. Alright, so you guys can go ahead and thank me right now for sparing you the pain of watching me uh, fit this filler block. I believe I said it was going to take about 20 or 30 minutes uh, to get this stone down to fit into the 3 8 inch slot and in fact that was probably about two hours ago at this point. Um, so I got it stoned down. It's important to be patient when you're doing this type of thing. Take your time, resist the urge to get out the Dremel tool or the bench grinder. Um, See, so I didn't show the installation but I got it stoned down to where the uh, filler block went about halfway. You want to get right to about where the apex of the barrel curve is and then I used a uh, hardwood block. Again, I supported the barrel with a piece of soft pine underneath to prevent any damage to the barrel. And I used a hardwood block and a wooden mallet to drift it the rest of the way in there. It's a good idea to put a couple of drops of high viscosity oil in there also. As you're drifting it in, that'll ease um, the fitting of one of these tight uh, 3 8 dovetail blocks. I did use a brass punch at one point in time. I used that brass screw that I showed earlier in the video to take it back out uh, after I test fit it with a piece of pine. Uh, and this must be very soft steel because you can see that brass screw, brass being a lot softer than steel generally, did create a slight dent right there, but I think I can live with that. Um, overall, I think it looks very nice. It gives a nice clean look. I've seen some guys that have installed receiver sights and they just leave this this eighth inch uh, dovetail cut empty and I, I always think that looks kind of crappy personally. I guess it's personal choice. So now we will reinstall the forearm, which I didn't show you it coming off, but I can show it going back on. Uh, let me wipe this down quick. There's already plenty of oil on here, but I don't want to leave any fingerprints or anything under the wood when I reinstall that because the forearm, you don't take that off very frequently. Um, so I don't want to leave anything under there that might cause rust to set up. So this, you can see it's shaped to go into the front of the receiver like so, 
and you just rock it up into place, slide the nose cap back, and we'll install the two screws. One goes there, and one goes there, and I'll be back in a moment, and then we will get to installing our receiver site. All right, so I think that looks pretty good. We've got our forearm back on there. These are a very tight fit. Um, it can take a little bit of finesse to get these screws back in. Uh, another thing you just have to be very patient and very careful with. You definitely do not want to cross thread these or do anything weird. Um, finesse is the key. And just like fitting this uh, filler block, any part of a project like this, if you're not confident in your own level of patience and in your own uh, level of ability, there is absolutely no shame in securing the services of your friendly neighborhood gunsmith to do any portion of a project like this or even the whole thing. But I think that looks pretty good. I mean, this thing is really starting to come together to look like a miniature buffalo rifle. So, let us one more time check and make sure that she's empty, uh, even though I know that she is. And let us now go ahead and install our receiver site. So we already removed the elevation slide uh, gantry apparatus from our block base uh, last week. So now we simply need to attach the block base to these two screw holes. Um, this one screw here, which uh, serves a purpose inside the mechanism of the gun, does sit slightly proud of the steel. Um, I've read online, I think some of the older Williams sight base blocks uh, were not relieved for that. This one is. It's got a machined uh, recess here, which will allow it to sit nice and flat on the side of our receiver. If yours is not like that, and I have read that's possible, uh, you're gonna need to locate that screw spot here and using a large diameter drill bit, or of course, if you have access to a milling machine, you can use an end mill to create a little pocket there just to give you a bit of um, clearance for this screw. You can see there's also a pocket milled out here um, I don't know what that's for. Um, that's not going to come in contact with any screws on this receiver. It must be for a different gun. Um, so anyway, we're just going to go ahead and take the supplied screws and attach the base to the side of the receiver. And again, you always want to be sure to have the right size of hollow ground parallel sided screwdriver that will fit your screw slot perfectly without any slop or play. And I actually like to, if you're using removable bits for a job like this, we're screwing into steel, but we're uh, engaging aluminum. I'll oftentimes, I'm gonna be using thread locker here, so I'm just actually going to use this and only tighten it as tight as I can get with my index finger and my thumb. That'll prevent us from over tightening and uh, wrecking something in here. And as I already mentioned, I'm going to use a little uh, thread locker. I'm using red. I know everybody always uh, recommends using blue, and they say if you use red, you'll never get the screws out. I have never, ever found that to be the case, that you need to use blue instead of red. And this is not the type of thing that gets removed very frequently, so I'm going to go ahead and use red just because I have it here. And you just put a tiny, tiniest little bit on the screw shank. And another tiny drop of red thread locker on the second screw. That might be a bit much. Take that off. And so I've got both of the screws lined up. So using my little parallel sided screwdriver, we'll simply tighten these down. Just finger tight. It's almost impossible to over tighten the screws this way. 
Now I install the screwdriver head in my screwdriver and we're going to give each of these just the slightest, making sure that we have it nice and square, just the slightest little tweak. We're going to let that red thread locker do most of the work here. Just the slightest little tweak and it looks like I got a little bit of Loctite there. And now I know that these screws aren't too long, but it's always a good idea to double check and make sure there's no no interference between the movement of the bolt and those screws, and there is not. So pretty happy with that so far. Now it's time for us to reinstall the elevation slide and gantry, and then we'll reinstall the gib lock. So the elevation slide is dovetailed and it just goes right down in this little track and you've got to get your elevation screw engaged in the threaded hole. Okay, that is now engaged. And that's how you're going to make elevation adjustments with this site when it comes time to shoot. We're going to screw it pretty far down. Um, get this sight pretty much down till it's almost touching the receiver. That's probably pretty good there. Now you can see there's a little bit, actually there isn't much play, but what the gib lock does, and the gib lock again is this little bushing which is slanted on one side to engage that dovetail. That just drops into this hole once we get it aligned properly. And the gib lock screw goes in here. And this you definitely don't want to use Loctite on or uh, crank it very hard because this needs to be loosened every time you make an elevation adjustment in your sights. So we just make that one finger tight for the time being. And there it is. We've got wind uh, elevation, we've got windage adjustments, uh, and then the elevation adjustment lock, I forgot, that's going to need to be uh, tightened down as well. Um, but yeah, that... I was complaining about the scope being too bulky. This is such a diminutive rifle. This sight is actually rather bulky. I'm going to have to see how I like it. But uh, that's all there is to installing it. And this should make for an interesting little iron sighted uh, long range varmint control and plinking rifle. Um, of course, if I decide I don't like this, we can always go back to a scope. Uh, I doubt that I would reinstall the rear sight, but we might go ahead and mount the scope back on this if we decide we don't like this. But, uh, yeah, I think it looks pretty good. Now, I, that's pretty much all there is to this project. Let's move back into the studio and wrap this up. So I think all in all, this project went about as smoothly as could be reasonably expected. Uh, once again, this 3 8 inch filler block from Marbles Took a little bit more fitting than I'm used to. Um, I have, as I mentioned, installed a couple of these on Marlin lever action rifles in the past, and none of them fit nearly as tightly as this one. None of them required as much stoning as I had to do on this one. Now, all of those other Marlin rifles were of A, newer vintage, and B, larger caliber. I don't know if that makes a difference. I have noticed some changes in the design of this Marbles filler block, so maybe Marbles is making its dovetail a little bit larger than they used to, but all in all, I mean, it took me about two hours of stoning to get it down to the right size, but it went in just fine, and it looks great, and, you know, our goal was to build a little miniature Quigley Buffalo rifle, and I think to that end, this has come out pretty nice. Now, this Williams foolproof sight with the target knobs is pretty wide. It's fairly bulky compared to other Williams sights that I'm familiar with. Um, my 
My uh, uh, Marlin 336 has a Williams 5D on it. This is a much larger rifle, and the Williams 5D is a much simpler sight, so it doesn't add nearly quite the same dimensions that the uh, Williams Foolproof does to the 39A. Uh, but I don't think this is outlandishly large or bulky. I think it's just going to take a little getting used to. It looks a little strange on this handy little saddle carbine right at the moment, but um, I think it's going to be just fine, and I think it's going to be just the ticket for this upcoming season's uh, uh, shooting shenanigans that we're going to be doing some uh, varmint control and some plinking. Uh, hopefully the club is going to open up soon so we can get out there. Um, I'd also like to go down to my cousin's uh, newly purchased farm in Maryland. I hear he's got a lot of groundhogs around the alfalfa and the corn, so hopefully we'll be taking care of some of that. Uh, I would look for all of those things coming up here on the channel. I'm going to try to split my time a little more evenly between the Suburban Rifleman and our sister channel, the Suburban Proletarian. I've got some other shooting ideas planned, uh, some more lever action shooting as well. I actually just recently got another Marlin 336. This one's the virtual uh, twin of my 3030, but this one's in 35 Remington. Um, it's amazing. I got it in essentially brand new condition, just like I got my 3030. My 3030 was 20 years old when I got it. This one's uh, probably older than that now, but they were both made in 1983. They have serial numbers that are only a few thousand units off of one another. Um, I, I have not fitted a, a receiver sight to this rifle as of yet. I've only had the rifle about a week, but I am specifically leaving the uh, Marbles Factory Semi Buckhorn Rear Sight on here to do some shooting experiments against my 3030. So that's going to be coming up. You're not going to want to miss any of that. The best way not to miss upcoming content is to become a subscriber. If you're already a subscriber, go ahead and click the little bell icon down below if you're watching this on YouTube. That will allow YouTube to send you notifications when I post new content to the channel. When I do that, I hope to see each of you here then. Later, guys.